Welcome to this final lecture in the module three. This will uh, concern source attribution approaches, concept definition and methods. After this lecture, you will not be expected to actually go out and perform source attribution studies. It will be addressed more carefully and in more details at the on-campus co uh, course. But here, uh, you will be familiar uh, with the concepts and the definition, and you will be expected to be able to remember these when you come to the uh, on-campus course. Source attribution methods addresses one, the number two one health question, what causes the problem? And seen in the integrated one health approach, we are going to talk about methods to identify transmission routes and also the most important food sources. This figure or drawing is illustrating the many different transmission routes that a foodborne infection can have. So even though we call it foodborne infection, many of them will actually also uh, be able to transmit uh, other, of other means and other transmission routes. We talk about three major transmission routes, the foodborne route, the direct animal contact route and the environmental route, which also include water. Human to human transmission is also an issue, of course, but we normally do not consider them as much in the uh, whole perspective of source attribution. One of the big challenges when we talk about source attribution is sometimes to distinguish between the environmental and the foodborne route, uh, and particularly between water and food. And that is because food are uh, because water is, also, water is also used in food production. Um, so it is very crucial that we define where in this production chain that we actually use, um, we actually do the attribution. Because if we do it at the reservoir level, then obviously water will have a larger impact on uh, the number of cases as such, because uh, here we have uh, water which again can come from food animals, but we have water that are contaminated and first and do not transmit to food before maybe during the processing level. However, if we do the attribution at the consumption level, then water will be mixed with food and then the food will be the one that will be held responsible even though the original source was the water. So therefore, it's very important that you are very precise on when you do your attribution at what level whether it's a point of exposure, and these are typically addressed by the microbial subtyping methods, which I will talk about in a minute, or if you do it at the point of exposure or consumption, which is the epidemiological studies that are mostly addressed by uh, this point. Source attribution methods can be divided into microbiological approaches and epidemiological approaches. We have already gone through uh, some of them, uh, the microbiological approaches um, is concerning microbial subtyping and also the comparative exposure assessment. The epidemiological approaches concern systematic review of case control studies, of sporadic infection and also analysis of data from outbreaks. As you will notice, I've also put two more in here uh, in a kind of faint color. This is expert elicitation and intervention studies or population studies. These can also be used for source attribution, but they will not be part of this, but you can read more about this, uh, them in, in the suggested reading. So source attribution using microbial subtyping is really about comparing number of human cases with particular subtypes uh, of, a diff of a particular pathogen with the distribution of the same subtypes isolated from animals and food. So let's take an example. This is an example from a Danish situation uh, where we have some reservoir of a particular um, pathogen, in this case salmonella, and we have different salmonella subtypes. Uh, as you will notice, we have uh, pigs, we have cattle, we have poultry, and we have table X. Uh, in cattle, we have a salmonella type called salmonella Dublin. Salmonella Dublin is only found in cattle. Uh, in, in this particular year, and for pigs, we only found, uh, in f and for pigs, we found Salmonella typhimurium DT12 and Salmonella Derby, but they was also not found in any other sources. And the same, we have these yellow types here and the green types here. These types that are only found in one single reservoir, we call the unique types. And these are kind of indicators of the reservoir's um, impact on human health. 
Obviously, we will also have some types that occur in many different uh, reservoirs. So, for instance, we have the salmonella type Imurium DT104, which occur in three uh, different reservoirs. We have these two that occur in two reservoirs, and we have this one over here occurring also in two, poultry and table egg. Let's keep this example and then make a very simplified example of this. Let's say that we have 40% of broiler flocks that are infected with Salmonella enteritidis fudge type 4 here. In the um, human statistics uh, of disease, we have 80 cases of Salmonella enteritidis with this particular type. Because this one is unique for broiler flocks, we say that all cases of human disease of this is caused by broilers. Now, we have 10% of flocks that are infected with Salmonella enteritis fast type 6. In total, we have 180 cases of fast type 6. If you remember from the previous slide, this type was also found in table eggs. Then we simply say, okay, 40 give rise to 80, 40% of flocks give rise to 80 human cases, then 10% of flocks give rise to 20 human cases. And the remaining cases are then uh, allocated to table lakes because there was the other source. This is, of course, a very simplified example. Usually we use mathematical model, uh, models to actually estimate this, models where we also are, um, where we also are able to take into account if there are any um, differences between the strains uh, with respect to uh, give rise to infection in humans. Some might be more virulent than others. Some might survive the food chain better than others. But this is just so you understand the concept. There are two model types available. One is called the frequency-based models methods, and they are using the principles that I just described by uh, identifying unique subtypes and then um, proportionally distribute um, the other serotypes or the other types uh, relative to this. Another uh, family of models are called population genetic models, exemplified by structure and the asymmetric island model. Uh, these require molecular methods and not phenotypic methods, subtyping methods, because they consider the relatedness of strains by taking into account recombination, mutation, and migration. Um, the main differences between these are that the frequency methods, um, frequency-based methods require a perfect match between subtypes. Uh, if you find a human, uh, a strain in humans with a subtype that is not found in any animal reservoirs, then that human case will actually be allocated to kind of an unknown category. We will not make any interpretation of the source of this human strain. Um, on the other hand, the population genetic methods uh, are because they're using a recombination, mutation and migration, are in, instead allocating to the strain, uh, to the uh, reservoir where the most closely um, related strain of the pathogen is found. So for instance, if we look at this uh, figure here, you could say, okay, we have maybe a human case with a type here. Uh, obviously, we will not have uh, any uh, completely um, identical found in a reservoir. Then we will move back and then we will find, okay, maybe our closest relative to this would be here, could be a chicken isolate, and then we say, okay, this human case belongs to chicken. So it is not requiring a perfect match. But of course, the discussion can be how far back in the phylogenetic tree should we go. For both methods, it is a requirement to have an integrated surveillance of animals, food and humans, and a heterogeneous distribution of subtypes um, among the sources. This method has been used for many years in Denmark to, um, um, to estimate the major sources of human salmonellosis. And as you can see, it's also used to um, see if the intervention have had any impact. So for instance, in the uh, late 80s, we have quite many human cases that were related to broilers. Then we put in a control program and we could see that the number of broiler-related cases uh, declined. And the same with pigs and most significant with eggs. And right now we have a kind of a low attribution to uh, domestic sources in Denmark, whereas imported food is a, a little more important. 
The next method I will go through is called the comparative exposure assessment. This method determines the relative importance of various exposure routes by combining occurrence or prevalence with consumption data or exposure data. It has been widely used in chemical exposure assessment and has kind of been adopted from chemical exposure assessment to uh, pathogens, but it is more limited used for pathogens. And that is because there are some um, limitation with regard to uh, data and also by the fact that pathogens are inactivated or they grow uh, and they grow through the production chain. So it's more difficult to estimate the actual exposure dose due to, for instance, bacteria. Uh, the methods used are very similar to the one you use for farm uh, to fork quantitative microbial risk assessment. And all this will be addressed more in the module four of this e-learning part. <clears throat> Very quickly, uh, the data uh, from all putative sources uh, of the pathogen that we need to know uh, in order to make a comparative exposure assessment are the prevalence of the pathogen in each source, source, the concentration of the pathogen, that is how many, for instance, bacteria per gram or CFU per gram, uh, what is the amount ingested in gram per exposure for food consumption, how many grams of chicken per week, for instance, and then the frequency of exposure, that is how many um, times do you eat chicken a week, could be um, a unit for that. And then you simply multiply all this for all exposure routes and you can calculate the mean number of the pathogen ingested per person per day per source. And then you can relate that for all sources included and see which source are most important. There's a lot of uncertainty involved in doing this, and you will also see here, this is some results from um, a study done uh, for Danish data from 2005, where we try to uh, illustrate the relative importance of transmission route of human semolosis. Um, you can say one of the advantages with this is that we can include sources that are not uh, necessarily um, a part of the integrated national surveillance. And what maybe came out as a, um, as a curiosity, you could say, was that uh, there were specific risk groups that were at high risk um, or where the exposure was quite high. And that was particularly, as you can see here, for pet owners of reptiles, pet owners of dog, and pet owners of horses. And that is, of course, because they're a limited population, but they, have, uh, they are exposed relatively often on a daily basis, more or less. And for instance, reptiles are known to be an important reservoir of salmonella. Of the food exposures, uh, we can see that the highest one was X, which is uh, very similar to what we get out when we use other methods of source attribution for salmonella. The next study is source attribution using outbreak data. So why do we want to use outbreak data for source attribution? Well, first of all, because for many hazards, it is the only conclusive indication of which foods cause illness. And in many countries where they don't have a very good reporting and they don't have surveillance of animals and food, it might be the only approach that we can take. Most countries will have some kind of outbreak reporting. One of the problem is that many outbreaks are caused by composite food. That means that it is food that is consisting of many different ing ingredients. Let's take the example with the hamburger. A hamburger consists of a bun and a beef burger and then salad, uh, tomatoes. Uh, so if we have an outbreak with a hamburger, which of these ingredients are actually the source of the outbreak, the primary source? So a solution to this problem, uh, you can uh, partitioning the composite food into mutual exclusive simple food categories and then distribute relatively to the occurrence of the simple food outbreaks. Let's take an example. So here you have a categorization scheme of foods. We try to encompass all foods in this, in this diagram. Uh, in major categories, uh, reflecting more or less the reservoir. So for instance, for poultry, we have laying hens, we have broilers, we have turkey, we have ducks. And for the ruminants, we have also a range. And for produce, uh, we have fruits and vegetables and so on. So let's take the example with the hamburger. Um, so if we have an outbreak with a hamburger sandwich, and we want to use that for attributing um, human disease cases, we can put the different ingredients in the hamburger in different categories. So the bun will go into grains and beans, the vegetables into let uh, sorry, the lettuce and tomato into vegetables, and the ground beef into beef. And then we simply look into 
okay, how many outbreaks of all the outbreaks that we have reported in a certain time period is caused by beef, how many by vegetables, how many by grains and beans, and then we distribute relatively to this. So if, for instance, 40% is caused by ground beef, then there is a 40% chance that the hamburger here will be caused by beef and so on. Very simple approach. This is uh, the results from a study done uh, on Latin America data in two decades, 1919, uh, from 1990 to 2000 and from 2000 to 2010. And what we have here is a, you can see that there's a significant uh, change in, in sources. Uh, the X seem, the importance of X for human salmonosis seemed to increase um, quite dramatically. Uh, between these two decades. We also see a reduction in the mean, with, and the, the X1 might actually be a real increase. We also see a quite significant decrease in meat. This might actually not be re a real increase, but more the fact that those that report outbreaks are better in identifying which kind of meat. So whether it is chicken, poultry, beef, pork. As you can see here, we suddenly saw an increase from pork, which might actually before have been registered in this blue bar. But in countries where we don't have many data on surveillance and, and, and human disease, this might be a way of indicating what the most important sources are. So the final method uh, is the systematic review and meta-analysis of case control studies of sporadic cases. We uh, went through uh, case control studies in lecture three. And to say something about sources on a more general plan, you could say, uh, we can do a systematic review of many case control studies. A systematic review is a formal process where you uh, make literature review that are focused on a specific research questions. And uh, questions to be in the salmonella world would be what are the most important risk factors for human salmonellosis. Uh, so you extract all these uh, studies that has been done. Uh, you go through a quality um, test uh, and, and you extract those that you think are qualified to go into your meta-analysis. A meta-analysis then consists of an analysis of the summarized statistics coming out. Uh, and that could be, uh, uh, or that is often the odds ratios. So you will take the odds ratios and you will pool them from all the different studies. You will pool them and a 95% confidence interval. And then you will give an overall odds ratio for particular risk factors then you can use these new adjusted odds ratios to calculate the population attribution of a fraction, which will give you the relative importance of different exposures, which again is your source attribution estimates. We have done two of these um, systematic reviews and for salmonella and campylobacteriosis respectively. And as you can see, this is uh, conducted uh, with uh, several studies um, and one of the most important sources in all stu or uh, across studies was travel and also uh, some of the more predisposing factors like medication or chronic disease, but also eating raw and undercooked egg. For, Cam for Campylobacter, again, maybe not as a big surprise, we have chicken undercooked. The NA stands for North America. That was because there's quite many studies done in, in North America, so they waited a lot so we could make an analysis only on North America data. So, so for chicken undercooked travel and chicken undercooked in, in total all came out as significant risk factor when we pooled the data from all these studies. So this is also a way to do source attribution. At the last slide, I put in here a toolbox for source attribution. Uh, it will just give you an overview of the different source attribution approaches, what the data requirements are for each of these, where they work, at what point of it, what is the point of attribution? Is it at the reservoir level or at the exposure level? And finally, what are the outcome? What do you get out of it? And how do they actually answer the question that you want to know? What are the most important sources? For further reading, I put in this, uh, these two uh, references. Uh, they are a bit overlapping, but it might be a good idea still to read both of them, that they will give you a, an overview of attribution methods. Thank you very much.